All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this uh, YouTube Live here on the Hot Zone. Uh, what I want to talk about today doesn't necessarily pertain to a, a war zone, but it could be called a disaster area. And uh, that's because we're talking about the U.S. government. And uh, many of you probably don't know that I worked, before I became a journalist, I worked for 10 years as a stockbroker in Washington, D.C. And during my time as a broker, I specialized in sort of a very arcane part of the brokerage business, had to do a lot of research. That kind of was my, my forte. And I, I spent a lot of time studying things like the money supply and economics and things like that. Even though uh, I only had one economics class in college, and I was talking about that yesterday, my economics teacher was a little more worried about uh, what I thought about God or politics than he was with uh, teaching me about economics. Fortunately for me, I am an autodidact, and so if I want to learn something, I'm going to learn everything there is to know about it. And uh, so this was something that was uh, very interesting to me, and I, I, you, I find myself using those research skills a lot in my job as a journalist, uh, and I intensely enjoy my job as a journalist far more than I did as a stockbroker. Uh, brokerage business was lucrative. But I, uh, you'll, I'll have to tell you my story sometime about how I uh, transitioned out of being a broker and into being a writer, which then led to me becoming a journalist. <clears throat> I, I just did that because I had all these very, very wealthy clients who I worked with for a decade. And almost every one of them at some point said to me, you know, I just wish that I had spent more time with my kids. And I was looking at my own life and thought, you know, that is going to be me. I'm going to have lots of money and I'm going to be regretting all the time I spent working because I was going to the office about the time my kids woke up and coming home about the time they went to bed and it wasn't really getting to know my kids or had let them know me very well. So decided to do something different, prayed about it, and God uh, called me to be a writer out of that. And that's how I became a writer. There's a lot more to that story and I'll have to tell you the whole thing sometime. But uh, suffice it to say that I uh, spent a lot of time poring over charts and figures and things like that, trying to find ways to make money for my clients. Um, I found a very interesting Twitter thread this morning that is it on? Is it back? Okay, holler when it comes back. Okay. It says connected now. Okay, I'm back. All right. Well, thank you for bearing with me with the terrible internet, folks. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to getting to Burma so I can have some decent internet. Uh, Panama uh, claims to be a first world country. Most In most ways it is. But uh, up here in the mountains, especially during the windy season, uh, right now we have winds outside probably 30 or 40 miles an hour. And uh, so it's very, very uh, bad. On It's very hard on the power lines. It's hard on the internet lines. And that, that's a big problem. So um, thank you for the congratulations on my new grandbaby. I am uh, very excited. I've been looking at photographs of her that are coming out of Armenia. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, well, it's not a matter of our router. It's just a matter of the, the pipeline coming in. Uh, internet's just, it's just terrible. It's just very bad. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. We've got the fastest we can get up here at the moment, but uh, hopefully that will change before too long. Anyway, so uh, as I was saying, we'll talk about the national debt uh, more in a minute and how the government lies to you about the national debt. But I wanted to point out more about uh, how the government lies about the jobs reports. And, because I found this Twitter thread uh, by a economist PhD 
uh, today that was really good in explaining uh, just how bad things actually are, even though the government, you've probably heard the government crowing about the fact that the inter, that, that the uh, economy is booming, that the stock market is at all-time highs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the actual numbers here and uh, see what we've what we find. So this is a, a disclaimer that you find at the bottom of the jobs reports, which I just wanted to point out because it, it seems sort of harmless, uh, but it says data users are cautioned that these annual population adjustments can affect the compa comparability of household data series over time. So it's just like this sort of random uh, disclaimer at the bottom that if you, if you were to read that, you wouldn't really know what that means. But what that's actually telling you is that the numbers we're giving you actually are not accurate. And so what I mean by that is, if we go to the jobs report, can you all see this? Tony, can you see it? Can, can you see this jobs report? Okay. Um, so... If we go here and look at the jobs reports and then the revised jobs reports uh, for the last, well, year or so, what you see is in red, the initial jobs reports that are published, and in blue, the revised jobs reports as published. There was only one month, November last year, where the jobs report was not revised downward uh, later on. And that's because they use some very rosy predictions and uh, extrapolations to try to convince you that the jobs are better than they actually are. Uh, in December, uh, the, the, the jobs report was actually revised up uh, later on, but uh, you see most months they get revised down. Now, the reason for this is twofold. Number one, to, again, make you think that things are better than they are. But number two, because if they revise the last month's job report before they, shortly before they put out this month's job report, it makes this month's job report look even better based on the revised numbers from last time. You, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, so if we just looked at the red lines here, uh, we would say, oh, these jobs are, are going up by about, I don't know, five, about 250, uh, 2,500, sorry, 2,500 looks like um, jobs per month. Uh, but if you then switched last month's to the blue line, it would go, oh, we went up by 5,000 uh, in the last month. Uh, looking, be, I'm looking at between like February and March of last year. Uh, so it is, it's cooking the books. And it's been done for a long time. It's not just this, uh, this regime or this uh, administration that's doing it. They've been doing this for decades. But what it shows you is that the government is intentionally lying to you uh, by exaggeration, uh, so that they can try to make things look better than they really are. Now let's look at non-farm households versus uh, non-farm non uh, job payrolls versus household employment level. These are two different ways that you can measure the uh, the the rate of employment in the United States. Very often, what they will quote to you is the first one: non-farm payrolls. The reason for that is because non-farm payrolls counts the number of total jobs, not the number of total workers. Meaning if, uh, so put a quote or, you know, put a comment in the comment box. If you have more than one job, if you actually get income from more than one source, uh, just say I do or something like that in the comments so we can see how many people do. Uh, the, the vast majority of people, I would say, in the United States get money from more than one source. And I certainly do. Uh, so 
the when they're counting the number of jobs, they can double count the number of workers. You see what I'm saying? If if you have two jobs, then you count as two jobs. You, you count as two workers in the non-farm payrolls. Okay, uh, and <clears throat> the household employment level doesn't do that. It only counts the number of workers. <clears throat> and if you look here in, in this, uh, I'm going to zoom this in so you can see what I'm talking about here in the last month or two, the green line is the number of non-farm payrolls, which is going up, but the number of workers, the, the, the number of total people working is going down. Um, and so if they're saying, <clears throat> wow, <clears throat> jobs are going up, well, they're just choosing which set of numbers to, to show you to make it look better than it really is. Uh, and <clears throat> this is so common. And I'm going to show you that this pervades the government, not just in the economy, not just in the, the, you know, the job sector, not just in unemployment, not just in the national debt, uh, but this pervades every area of government. So let, let's go on. And I'll show you uh, what I mean here. So the number of full-time uh, employment, people with full-time employment, number of people with full-time employment uh, is declining. Uh, it's down it's at 60. It's, now this is seasonally adjusted. Okay. Negative 60 uh, monthly change in in employment level. So the red one is full-time employees. The green one is part-time employees. So we have growth in part-time employees, but a loss in full-time employees. That means it's harder for people to get the benefits that they need, like health insurance and retirement plans. And uh, the number of people, if, if you look at the, the stats of the number of people who are actually putting money away for retirement, that number has been plummeting. And this is why. Uh, the, the number has been plummeting because more and more people are working multiple part-time jobs rather than one full-time job. And part of the reason for that is that it's not that there aren't full-time jobs out there. It's that the, the way the government punishes companies who hire full-time workers uh, by forcing them to do all sorts of things is doing two things. It's causing companies to... Uh, hire people just up to the limit of part uh, of full time but not quite over the limit uh, so part time hours only because then it's it's cheaper for the companies the second thing is uh it's pushing jobs overseas because like for me if i need to hire somebody to say uh transcribe a uh, an interview i'm just picking something I, right now i do that with ai but uh, if I need to hire somebody to transcribe an interview and I can hire somebody in the United States to be my transcriptionist, I, A, I'm going to pay a lot more money because I have to pay for Obamacare. I have to pay for, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, like, I have to pay off the lawyers, right? Uh, and what that does, it just increases the cost to me of that employee. But if I hire a guy in Indonesia, I'm going to pay him much less and the, the internet allows me to do that. So uh, the... Government's regulations is what causes this disparity here between part-time and full-time jobs. Uh, now let's go look at weekly hours. Uh, if we look here, it, it, since nine, uh, 2020, uh, this, this here is 2020, uh, this decline, this sharp decline you see here, uh, this is the number of weekly hours that people are working. The number of hours has been declining. So that's another measure of what I just showed you, that part-time jobs are growing fastest and full-time jobs are not. But when the government looks at non-farm payrolls and they just say, wow, the number of jobs is going up. The jobs report looks great. They look at the number of jobs going up. They're not taking into account. Well, they, I mean, they know it, but they know that you don't know it. And so they they show you only the numbers that make them look good, right? So um, let's see here. The next one is 
uh, who provides most of the jobs that are in this job growth. Uh, what we see here is that the number one growing sector of job growth is healthcare. And there's a good reason for that because the United States population is getting older. And there, so there's more need for healthcare in the United States. That's, that's good. Unfortunately, most of those jobs are not doctors and, you know, high paying people. They are um, assistants and, you know, like dental assistants and things like that, that are maybe not um, uh, EMTs, things like that, that are maybe not, uh, you know, working at uh, minimum wage, but they're pretty close to it. Uh, now, the look at the second one here, the blue one. This is government, okay? So it's pretty easy for the government to say that uh, the economy is booming when the government is providing the majority of the new jobs. Uh, but the when government is providing the jobs, that means these people are not adding anything to the economy. Uh, so if you're in construction and you're out there working, you're building a new house. That new house that you're building is a boon to the economy because then somebody's going to buy the house, somebody's going to sell the house, they got to put furniture in the house, they got to get uh, utilities to the house. Uh, you're, you're creating something new that didn't exist before, and that builds on the United States economy. But a government worker is not building to, on the United States economy, it's sucking jobs out of the economy. Now, if you include in that, not just jobs that are being provided by the government that are, you know, uh, bureaucrats, but you talk about jobs that the government is providing with your tax dollars, meaning they're taxing you, they're taking money from you in taxes, and they're using that money to buy things in the United States that those things they're buying create jobs. So a very good example of this is the war in Ukraine. Um, the vast majority of the money that is being spent on Ukraine, you've heard that there's a hundred trillion, a hundred billion dollars that's been spent on Ukraine. The vast majority of that, probably 80% of that is not going to Ukraine. It's going to the United States and it's going to Boeing and it's going to DynCorp and it's going to uh, Sikorsky and it's go, you know it's going to the the weapons manufacturers and things like that and so those companies are hiring more workers and, and it's, you know they they're creating more jobs but they're doing it with your tax dollars and uh, that's not necessarily a terrible thing but it's not as good as a job that is created in the free market why because the government has to take that money from you in order to give it to somebody so that they can create jobs with it. And the government is so notoriously corrupt and inefficient that about 40% of the money that they take in taxes falls out before it gets to any of those programs uh, because it, it, the government's overhead is just so high. Now, if there was a charity out there that had a 40% overhead, they would be a pariah. Nobody would... Uh, would invest in that charity. A charity with a 10% overhead is terrible. Um, as I was saying, I think yesterday, o Operation Blessing, the CBN charity that I work with a lot, uh, has an overhead of 0.7%. But the U.S. government has a, a, an overhead of 40%. So they have to take a dollar from you to get 60 cents out in a program that can then create jobs. If they would allow the free market to create the jobs instead, it would be almost one for one. It'd be 100% of that money would go to create jobs and would create a lot more jobs. So that's one of the reasons why it's not great that most of the jobs are coming from government. Um, and actually the, the trickle down effect of the government buying stuff in the economy that then creates more jobs trickles down to construction, professional business services, blah, 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 blah. But again, it's very highly inefficient. And so that the, the government is creating a self-fulfilling prophecy by taxing you more and then using those tax dollars to buy stuff with, that it's giving to Ukraine or giving to you know uh, Israel or uh, giving back to you 
uh, giving to, to unemployed people, you know, uh, social welfare programs, things like that. Uh, all of that stuff is a very, very inefficient way to grow the economy. And it, it's an artificial boost to the government's numbers. So it makes the government look better than they actually are uh, when they show you, you know, they, because I'm, I'm, I wanted to do this podcast because we're coming into election season. You're going to hear politicians claiming all sorts of stuff, how they saved the world and, you know, created jobs and did all this stuff. But I want you to remember this podcast when you see that. I want you to like and share this podcast with your friends so that they will know too. This is an important podcast to get the word out to people about how the government lies to you because we're coming into the time when the government is going to be lying to you to try to get your vote. All right. Now, uh, here's the where it really gets frustrating. Uh, if you thought that what I was telling you so far was bad, um, here's, here's what's worse. Uh, Melissa asked, will you be discussing the threat on the USA Today? Maybe at the end real quick, I can do that uh, if we have time. Uh, this is the part that really gets me. The red line is the growth in um, the red line is the growth in native born employment. That's um, people getting jobs who were born in America. And you see there that that those are not trending up as fast as the blue line, which is foreign born employment people getting jobs in America who were not born in America. Uh, now, the United States, I, I, look, if you immigrated here and got a green card legally and you, you go get a job, I think that's great. And, and those people are in that blue number. Uh, and I don't have a problem with that. But also in that blue number are people who are not here legally, who are making um, uh, the asylum claims in the United States, the vast majority of which are fraudulent. Uh, almost every single asylum claim in America today is fraudulent. Um, as I've covered the immigration issue, you, you find that out right away. Everybody coming to the United States is an economic migrant with this very, very not small number of people coming from Mexico who have a valid asylum claim. But, for example, Joe Biden just uh, extended the time and... and uh, halted any deportations of Palestinians in the United States. Um, so Palestinians who are in the United States illegally are now get to stay here and will not be deported. And he gave them work permits so they can go get jobs. And that means that they show up in that blue number of foreign born workers getting the most jobs. Uh, so the vast majority of the growth, this, uh, this graph shows, the vast majority of the growth uh, that we see in the, the jobs reports up here uh, are actually coming from people who are in the United States illegally waiting for their, uh, their asylum hearing, which will be denied. They, they do not qualify for asylum. But they've crossed the border illegally. They've made an asylum claim. The Biden administration lets them in instead of making, making them wait in Mexico. And they have given 7 million people uh, who have come in that way the ability to come into the United States and work. That's why you've heard me say that one of the reasons why the Biden administration is allowing this uh, massive wave of illegal migration into the United States is to create more jobs because it makes the economy look artificially better than it is. Uh, and so that obviously is, this is where it really gets frustrating, okay? Um, you look here, native born, this is annual change in employment level. Uh, so people who have been, who were born in the United States are, uh, 200,000 fewer people are employed over the last year. Okay, so in reality, if you took out the foreign-born workers on the right, the economy would look abysmal because 200,000 fewer people are actually, you know, employed in the United States. But because 1.7 million nearly foreign-born workers are now working in the United States, the vast majority of which are here illegally, 
it makes the economy numbers look better. So when you hear the Biden administration throughout this next few months, all the way up to November, crowing, running around the, the, the country, making uh, TV uh, ads and stuff saying that we, the economy is booming, we've done better, we've done such a good job. This is how they did it. This is how they did it. They brought in 10 million undocumented illegal aliens. They put 1.7 million of them to work taking jobs away from people who were born in America. And they're calling that progress. Okay. This is why I wanted to show you this. Okay. Now, here's another uh, kind of frustrating way that they lie to you. These are people who have dropped out of the labor force. So the number of people that in thousands who are not in the labor force uh, is, has been rising. You see that gigantic jump, uh, that, that's COVID right there. And it, then it's been pretty s stable since then. But this is how they lie about the unemployment rate. Right now, the Biden administration says the unemployment rate is, is uh, under 4%. It's like 3.7%, which is a very good unemployment rate. That there's always going to be some unemployed people in the United States. And under 5% is usually pretty good. Over 5% starts getting pretty bad. Uh, when you get up to 10%, which it was during the Obama administration, um, th it's terrible. But the Obama administration changed something about how they measure unemployment. They used to include the number of people who have just said, screw it. I'm not looking for a job anymore. I'm just done. I'm just, I'm, for, I'm, I'm not going to work. Forget it. And they've just dropped out of the employment pool altogether. And they, they used to include that in the unemployment numbers from the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, they don't include those numbers anymore. And so if you were to add the people back in who are, are just so frustrated, they're not even looking for a job anymore, the actual employment rate is almost 8% now, right now, as we speak in the United States. And 8% is not the worst, but it's certainly not 3.7%. And so this, this is something that when, when you look at this, yeah, uh, I just saw Jan said three years ago, I used to get a dozen jumbo eggs for 99 cents under Trump. Now it's $3 a dozen. Well, when you look at uh, these, no, wait, no, there, these numbers, what you see is that people are working more hours, but the amount of money that they get is less. The, the hourly, the number of hours they work is up, but the amount of money they make is down, okay? Uh, and so that doesn't even take into account inflation. So what they've done with the unemployment rate, if we look at the, uh, so we were talking about the people missing from the labor force is, is rising, and that number is no longer counted in the unemployment rate. So if we were to take the, over here on the left, the official unemployment rate uh, right there amounts to about 3.7%. But when you go over here to the household survey, it's over 7%. You say 7.5% nearly. Um, and so again, just pointing out that the government is lying to you about the unemployment rate, but they're also lying to you about the inflation rate because they did the exact same thing with inflation. Right now, the, the administration has been crowing about the fact that they have <clears throat> managed to reduce the inflation rate from as, it was absolutely terrible <clears throat> when they, um, after the first year in office. Uh, the inflation rate, a lot of that <clears throat> is not, I, I don't blame it on the Biden administration, you can't because, uh, the Trump administration uh, spent like a drunken sailor during COVID to try to prop up the economy. And the Biden administration would have done twice that. So it's, it's not a Trump versus Biden thing. It's just the fact that the government was, uh, governments of all over the world were trying to, uh, you know, help 
bolster their economies during COVID when nobody was working. And they did that by just printing money like crazy and pumping it into the economy. Well, that necessarily has to lead to inflation. And inflation is what we got. But the Biden administration has been slowly changing how they measure inflation. And so what that does, it makes the inflation rate actually look like it's going down when it's really not. And so if you went back to the 1980s and measured the inflation rate based on the same metrics that we used back then, the inflation rate would be almost as bad as it was in the 1970s when we had 14% um, uh, interest rates uh, and things like that. And so, again, they're just lying to you with the numbers. They're changing how they measure the numbers, and they're lying to you with the numbers. Here's another way they do that. Uh, they do that in the tax rate. Did you know that most people in the United States pay nearly half their income in taxes? Um, but they don't know that, partially because they force the employers to take the taxes out before they pay you. If, if I were president and had my way, I would push for a constitutional amendment that said that taxes must be paid by the taxpayer every year. That, the, that you cannot have the employer pay the taxes. They have to be paid by the end user. There's Muppet. Oh, she's resting <clears throat> over there. I didn't even know she was back there. Um, they, if, we, if they did that, I think no politician would ever get reelected because uh, they, they try to hide from you how much you're actually paying in taxes. But if you think about what you're paying in taxes, it's not just federal taxes. It's not just Medi Medicare, Social Security, state taxes, uh, municipal taxes, property taxes, uh, sales taxes, uh, cell phone taxes, travel taxes, uh, you know, we could go on and on and on with all that. I mean, I, I think I paid like over $20,000 last year just in airline ticket taxes. Uh, and as a self-employed guy, I have to pay my own taxes. I don't, I, I don't have an employer to pay them for me. And so I, have to, I get to see what I am paying every year in taxes. And that's one of the reasons I moved to Panama, because the year before we moved to Panama, I paid over 60% of my income in taxes. And I just was like, that's... It's just too much. It's just too much. It's it's like they there's a word for this. It's called slavery. If I have to work until September every year, from January to September, and I don't get to keep one red cent of what I earn, I have to give it all to the government somehow. Road tolls and everything else, sales tax. I have to give it all to the government. That's called slavery, folks. So I mean, who would put up with that? If you had knew that you had to work as a slave for six months out of the year, there would be a riot. But most Americans are doing that. Most Americans are actually paying about half their income in taxes. So again, they're just lying to you with statistics. Just one more way that they do that. Um, so how do you get, Carla Joseph, how do you get a tax break? I think you meant like for living in Panama. There's a, a, a tax thing that uh, allows me, because most of my income comes from outside the United States, if I don't live in the United States, I qualify for something called the foreign earned income exclusion, and I can write off uh, a, a good portion of what I make uh, and pay no federal tax, although I still have to pay Social Security, Medicare, state, uh, well, some state tax, some sales tax, some, you know, a, a bunch of stuff. So it cuts my effective tax rate almost in half, uh, but it's, I still pay too much. Even then, I still pay too much. Now, um, let's go talk about the, the national debt. Uh, here's the U.S. debt clock. And if you look over here in the top left corner, let's see if I can zoom that in somehow. That might get difficult to do. Uh, the U.S. national debt stands right now $34.2 trillion. Trillion with a T. That's a lot. When I was in college, uh, I remember when the national debt hit $1 trillion. And me and my friends were really up in arms about how un un uh, 
irresponsible the government had been to let the, the national debt get that high. And we staged a protest by riding our bicycles uh, one, I think it was one inch for every dollar in the trillion dollar debt. And it was like a 30 something mile ride. I don't know, whatever it was. It was a, a, a terrible idea because nobody cared. Uh, we got a little bit of press for you know doing it, but nobody cares, of course. And now we're looking at $34 trillion in debt. But here's the thing. They don't measure the debt today like they did when I did my bicycle ride back in 1994 or whenever that was, uh, 93, something like that. They don't, they don't measure it the same way now. They've changed the rules of the game. They, they've moved the goalposts. And so what that means is they are, they're lying to you about how much the government owes, how much you owe as a citizen in the United States. Uh, if you were to, to go back and start measuring the way that they did back then, the national debt would be much higher than it actually is. It shows now at $34 trillion. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if you start, because what they do is they start moving things around and calling them different giving them different names. So they don't, that, well, that's not debt. That's an unfunded liability. That's a, you know, whatever. Uh, and so there is a line for unfunded liabilities on this debt clock and it's down in the bottom right corner. Uh, so let's see if I can show you that one. Down in the bottom right corner, U.S. unfunded liabilities, $212.8 trillion dollars. So there's your actual national debt, folks. It's not 34 trillion, it's 212 trillion dollars. 212 trillion dollars. That is like 49 times what the government collects in taxes every year. So to put that into perspective, because we it's so much money, it's just hard to even wrap your head around. What's $49 trillion? It could be $409 trillion. It could be, it could, yeah, I mean, we don't know. Uh, you know, when it gets to that number, it's just impossible for you even to fathom. Well, let's put it into perspective. If your head, if your, your <laughs> my head just exploded. Uh, if, if you made the average wage that uh, Americans make, which is about $68,000 a year. Uh, if we were to go over to that and say, what's um, 68,000 times 49? Uh, okay. That is. Okay. So if you made the average that an American earns, which is about $68,000 a year, and you owed as much as the federal government owes, uh, now I don't mean, I, I mean relatively, okay? If, uh, so the U.S. government takes in about $4.9 trillion a year. That's their income. Their debt is actually $228 uh, trillion. Uh, so they owe about 40, uh, let's, let's get it exact. Uh, so 228, let's see, 228 trillion divided by, by 4.9 trillion is 46.53 times their income. Uh, so if you made 68,000, times 46.53, uh, you're talking about $3.1 million. So if you, let's say that basically to, to put that into perspective, you are an average American family making $69,000 a year. Uh, and I'm sorry, $68,000 a year. And you have a mortgage on your house for 3.1 
$1.6 million. So you're making what about not quite $6,000. Let's say, let's just round it off, say $6,000 a month. And your mortgage alone would amount to about $30,000 a month. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. So the United States has already blown way past uh, the, the, the ability to service their liabilities, way past it. But they've been kicking the can down the road, hiding the liabilities. Um, Swiss Shard says, I don't know anyone that makes 68000 a year. Uh, do you mean everybody you know makes more than that or less than that? I would say probably more than that. Um, but maybe you just run in a different crowd because there are a lot of people in America that don't make anywhere near that. Um, I mean, my kids are very happy, you know, out there getting their first jobs, making half that. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the vast majority of the soldiers in the U.S. military, soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and Marines don't make $68,000 a year. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't make that. Uh, so uh, that is the actual average. Now, if you have a two-income family, um, you could be making twice that. But I'm telling you what the average is. And that the, the point is, you wonder why you can't afford eggs. You wonder why you can't afford a house. You wonder why most people, uh, you know, are, are having trouble making ends meet. Uh, you know, there was a time when, you know, Raw 2029 says, I may be six, 68, uh, but he says he made $90. Who, who just said that? Oh, uh, Ray Taylor says, when I got drafted, I got $90 a month. Well, Ray, back then a man could get a job and could support his wife and children on one income. But it's gotten to the point now where it almost requires two incomes to, you know, make ends meet. And if things keep getting worse, every guy's going to have to get three more wives just to make the bills. So uh, I'm joking. That's a joke. That's a joke, Connie. That's where I'm, I'm joking. Uh, so, okay, less than 68000 here in South Texas. Okay, Swiss Shard says. Um, so this is why it's getting so difficult to make ends meet because the real numbers for our economy are much worse than what the government is telling you. So if you've watched the news and you've wondered why, why is it so, you know, what, what's this disparity here? Now, you know, now you understand the government is lying to you with statistics and that is my live for today. So let's see if there's any questions uh, or comments. Uh, so it's interesting that you say, my first job was a six, Mike Connor says, I'm 69, my first job was $65 an hour. Wow, that was a good job back in the day. I don't know what in the world you must've done. Yeah, my uh, Carla Joe says my daughter only makes twenty four hundred a month. She works full time. Really needs insurance. Uh, yeah, my daughter is right, right there. Same, same thing. Uh, people that are on Social Security, you're on a fixed income, making fourteen grand a year. How are you supposed to make ends meet? That's why there's so many people that are on Social Security who are moving out of the United States to go someplace that's cheaper. Uh, this is now, now you understand, now you're starting to get it, why things seem so much more difficult than they really are. Okay. So, uh, I am going to go because Connie's got to run to an appointment and I've got to finish packing and get to the airport. I'm again, leaving today, heading for, uh, Burma and I will be, uh, trying to do lives, uh, where, whenever I can, as I'm traveling, Maybe I'll do one from Istanbul. Maybe I'll do one from uh, uh, Bangkok, wherever. Uh, but just stay tuned and uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted on what is happening to me. Uh, Rich River says, do you think if Trump were reelected, he would be more responsible with our national budget? He wasn't uh, during his first term, so I don't know why he would be with his second. Um, 
the the thing is with our system, the the way our system is, uh, a president has like four years to make himself look good, and it's gotten to the point where they take as many shortcuts as they can to try to make themselves look good, and most of those shortcuts are not good for America. Um, so this is a multi generational problem that crosses the boundaries of tribe and political party. Uh, this is a very, very common thing. Uh, and so, oh, somebody was asking about the threat that was brought up about um, uh, by, uh, I forget, his, I think it's the Speaker of the House, or somebody brought up a, a unstated threat to America, national security threat, and was pushing the Biden administration to uh, declassify what they had seen so that it could they could have a conversation about what to do about it. Um, the rumor is that what they're talking about is that Russia has been experimenting with putting nuclear weapons into space to take out U.S. satellites. And um, this is something that if you've been following the hot zone, I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, on If you go to chuckholton.com, uh, you can sign up over there and see my documentaries. L I literally have a documentary about this topic, uh, the threat of a, an EMP from space. Uh, if the, uh, the Russians did have a nuclear weapon in space, they could detonate that nuclear weapon over the United States and fry everything electronic, including your car, including your phone, including everything electronic. Uh, in the blink of an eye, and it would set the United States back to the 1880s. And it would result in probably 90% of the people in the United States dying within the first year. Uh, I've made a, a full-length documentary about that. It's on chuckholton.com. You can go watch it uh, if you want. I will pin it to the top of chuckholton.com over there on the Locals page so that you can find it easily. Um, but uh, this has been a threat not just from Russia, but from North Korea. Um, so they're talking about, well, Star Wars was about uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could fly into space and then come down on the United States. It was not about a nuclear EMP. Uh, but what they're, this threat that they're, I, again, this is a rumor, but the threat is, uh, the, the rumor is that the Russians are uh, trying to get a nuke into space and if there's a Russian nuke floating around out there in space, all they have to do is push a button and the United States ceases to exist for all intents and purposes. This is a major issue. It's one reason why I made the documentary, because we need to be confronting this issue. We need to be pressing our Congress critters to do something about hardening the power grid and putting aside, um, you know, spares in terms of uh, ultra high uh, voltage transformers and things like that. Uh, modernizing our power grid. Uh, of course, if that were to happen, uh, it would be very difficult at that point for the United States to determine who did it and to respond. And so, yes, it's a huge th threat. It's a huge problem. If Russia is actually trying to put a nuke into space, we need to be very, very concerned. Um, and for sure, that's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, does the government want us to be on government health care is that why healthcare is booming? Uh, well, they do want to socialize healthcare. And the reason they want to socialize healthcare is because it gives them control over every single aspect of your life. If you want to know what socialized medicine looks like, it, uh, it, it makes socialized medicine, uh, makes your healthcare look cheaper, although it's not. It makes it look cheaper because it's paid for just like your taxes are before you get your paycheck. So it's paid for by your employer, and you don't have to actually write the check every month to pay for your health care. Uh, obviously, doctors don't work for free. Hospitals don't work for free. So nationalized health care is just changing the way that it's paid for, but it still comes out of your pocket because you are the end user. And that's the thing that many people in Canada and the UK just don't get. They don't understand that that they are paying for their health care and that their the quality of their health care in Canada and the UK is much lower than the quality of health care you can get in the United States or elsewhere. Um, however, they want 
you to be on nationalized health care because it makes it look like the government is providing you something for free and, oh, aren't we magnanimous and therefore you're going to vote for us again. But it also gives them control over every aspect of your life. If you go to the UK, you will find that the, the um, it's called health and, I think it's health and welfare or something like that. There, there's a whole department of the government that goes around sticking its nose into your life and it goes far beyond like you have to wear a seat belt or you have to wear a helmet when you're riding a bicycle. It, it's like unbelievable. Like I, I took a contract with a, a UK company and uh, that was going to be overseas somewhere. And I had to sit down and have a Zoom call with a psychiatrist to talk about the potential post-traumatic stress that I might suffer by doing the job that I had just agreed to do with this. And it wasted an hour of my time. Well, you add that up, uh, that hour of time times everybody in the UK, times everything that they do, and it is a huge drag on their economy and a drag on their health healthcare. Um, and uh, personally, I don't want to live in a place where the government can tell me every single thing about, they, they can... Uh, talk. They can they can get into your bedroom, and they can talk about your your you know. I mean, gun gun control. It's already getting to the point where you go to the doctor, and the first thing they ask you is whether or not you have a gun in the home. Uh, but in in the UK, th these are the kind of things the government can control about you, or they can say, you know what, we can control the number of miles you can drive every week because we have to, it's, it, you know, the, the pollution is causing a health problem for our people. And if it causes problems for our people, then we have to pay for it and therefore we can control it. It's a, it's a vicious cycle that gives the government far too much control. And that's really what they want. Was there ever a time we had a surplus instead of a debt? Yes, of course there was. Uh, there was a time, believe it or not, when there was no such thing as income taxes. And yet the government still survived. The government was able to function without any tax dollars from, from us at all. And up until the 19, I think it was 1930s, um, when the U.S. federal tax started, and people almost rioted when it was a 1% tax. And now it's nearly 50% for most people in America. And the people who pay 80% of the taxes are the people, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, almost, well, let's say about 70% of people in America, I'm sorry, about 40% of people in America pay no tax to the federal government at all. And so they think, oh, well, you know, go ahead and raise taxes. Oh, go ahead and give us socialized medicine because I don't pay any taxes. That's fine. It's whatever. But what they don't understand is that you're still paying a tremendous amount of taxes in uh, your everything you buy. You're paying taxes in road tolls. You're paying taxes in property tax. You're paying taxes in, uh, I mean, there's just, it's just on and on and on. Not only that, but people who pay no, uh, there, there's another hidden tax. It's a voluntary tax that people line up to pay. And it's called the, uh, the lottery. Did you know? I mean, the lottery is basically just a tax on people that are bad at math. Uh, because the government uses the, the money that they gain from the lottery to do a lot of the things that taxes would do, would, would otherwise have to do, and people line up to pay it. And the, the, about 80% or more than, eight, I did a study on this when I was in college, more than 80% of the lottery tickets are purchased by people who make less than half of the uh, you know, average wage in America. Think about that. This is a voluntary tax. Cigarette taxes, the vast majority, almost 90% of cigarette taxes are paid by people who make less than $100,000 a year. Um, I mean, the, again, this is a tax on people that are bad at math and, and you know, not very, don't care about their health. So uh, there are lots of ways that the government finds to get your money that aren't your actual federal tax return, aren't on your federal tax return. Um, so Colin says, I understand that not voting is not a solution because the incumbent gets your vote if you choose not to vote. Well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, not voting. I, I don't know. I'm so frustrated with the, the voting, the irregularities that were seen in the last several elections. I don't know what to tell you about voting. Um, but uh, you definitely should vote. Why? I mean, it can't hurt to vote. 
Uh, I don't know that it helps a lot, but it, it can't hurt. Uh, but, you know, the people who are receiving benefits from the government, who also pay no federal tax, they also get to vote. And do you think they're going to vote for anybody that's going to give them fewer benefits or more benefits? Do you think they're going to vote for people who are going to, you know, make them pay taxes or not pay taxes, right? This is uh, taxes, uh, income taxes by the federal government is just a giant scheme to buy people's votes with your money uh, and to put policies in place that you don't agree with. Uh, and so uh, I, I hate to say it, that's, I know this is not a uh, cheery uh, you know, thing for us to talk about, but that's the truth of it, folks. And so um, that's all I've got for today. We've got to run. Uh, God bless you. Thank you very much for watching. And again, I will uh, be on as much as I can, uh, but um, I hope you will like and share the podcast and go over to chuckholton.com. Uh, we are going to be putting up stuff while I'm gone, even if I'm unable to put put up things. We've been making a lot of extra content we're going to be putting up. So uh, please keep coming back and uh, I'll try to be over on CBN as much as possible as well. Okay. God bless you. Take care.